Hello and welcome to another episode from the Synapse e-learning series. With us today we have Dr. Pierre Schemmler-Wismeyer, a senior lecturer at the Department of Anatomy within the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Malta. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Doctor. My pleasure. And uh, he has an interest in stem cell research and in fact we're going to be speaking about private cord blood banking, not here just in Malta but also on a global le level. And that brings me to my first question. Um, doctor, from your opinion, from a professional perspective, how do you see um, uh, private cord blood banking as it's gaining ground here in Malta? Is it actually an investment or is it a uh, symptom of our just-in-case syndrome? Um, I, I, think, I think it's only fair to say, just like when I give talks to, to expectant mothers, um, that there is absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever with cord blood banking. The only thing about it with private cord blood banking I'm talking the only thing about it is that the chances of actually using it are a lot lower than uh, one may be made to believe, with, with a few particular exceptions, which I can point out later on. Um, just to give you an idea, the, the uh, hypotheses nowadays, or the estimates nowadays, are that with most normal families, the chances of actually using the cord blood for a member within the family is something like 1 in 50,000. So as you can see, the, the, the chances of actually using it are, are quite low. The cases when this increases considerably are two major ones. One is when uh, the family has a strong history of a particular genetic disease. So in Malta, for example, we'll be talking about things like thalassemia or like G6PD deficiency, favism. Um, I should point out that this does not count for all genetic diseases. So for example, in the case of cystic fibrosis, again, it's not particularly useful because it needs to be the kind of genetic disease where a, a stem cell transfusion, the equivalent of a bone marrow transfusion, would actually cure the condition. Um, the other uh, main exception is when one or both of the partners is from a considerably uh, divergent or, or different genetic grouping. Um, I'm not trying to give any, any fodder to um, certain racist elements in Maltese society, but um, the, the truth is that genetically, just like we have different blood groups, in Europe, for example, there is the O blood group, and in South America there is much more of the B blood group. In Europe it's mostly O and A. Similarly, different groups have different HLA typing, and therefore when you have a family, uh, both parents or one parent, who is either Sub-Saharan African, or Far Eastern, Korean, Chinese, Japanese. And in those cases, the chances that there will be an HLA match found within European and American uh, Caucasian-based uh, bone marrow banks around the world are actually quite small, um, because obviously these, these populations are minorities in, in Europe and in, and in uh, North America. And therefore, because of this, um, one may consider in those cases, again, private corporate banking. In most uh, other European populations, like I said, the chances of actually using it are, are actually very low. So, as you said, um, you mentioned the statistics 1 in 50,000. Yes. Um, do you see this changing in the future with uh, potential breakthroughs in scientific research? Or? Yes, I mean, this is the other point which is often made in terms of selling this, this, uh, this tissue, this, this, this banking service. Um, the, the point that, that in the future things will get better. It is true, without a doubt, that in the future there will be more uses for stem cells. Uh, what is unfortunately not said at the same time is in the future we will probably not need cord blood at all because a couple of years ago, for those who are interested in such things, um, both the Nobel Prize and the equivalent American the Breakthrough Prize, um, which was established by people like uh, Facebook founder and, and Google founders basically, um, were both given to a certain Japanese researcher, a medical doctor called Shinya Yamanaka, and Shinya Yamanaka's Nobel Prize and the, the research he did was basically to convert a normal uh, skin cell into a pluripotent stem cell. Our pluripotent stem cell is basically a stem cell with the capabilities of an embryonic stem cell without creating any embryos or having uh, therefore any ethical issues. So in other words, in the very near future, we will be able to have stem cells of an even more powerful nature than cord blood, stem cells for almost everyone. And this is already beginning to happen in Japan, for example. So, although, yes, in the future there will be more uses for um, stem cells, cord blood will probably be very strongly superseded as a source. And that would make cord blood banking irrelevant? Yes. So, uh, imagine that we still have cord blood and this issue, and this pluripotent stem cell, um, will not come to like, come to bear fruit in the coming decades. Right. Uh, so, we rely solely on cord blood. Yes. How long will it remain viable for these potential applications to truly, you know, 
serve their purpose. Okay, so so the, the, the main applications which are discussed, the main applications which are discussed are, are the following. I should point out first of all there are two sets of stem cells we are talking about over here. The one set which are the hematopoietic stem cells are actually found primarily in the cord blood itself. Um, and the other set, which are called mesenchymal stem cells, are found within the cord. In fact, nowadays, most of the private banks will give you the opportunity of banking either the cord blood alone or the cord blood and part of the cord itself. The uh, hematopoietic stem cells are most commonly used for two major uses. One of them is, in fact, the treatment of genetic disease, as I've already told you. And here I should point out the important point that who is treated is primarily the brothers or sisters. So again, the idea that the cord blood can be used to treat either the baby themselves, who's, who's been born, or the parents, or the uncles and aunts, or the grandparents, or etc., etc., is actually un untrue. And that's frequently advertised. That is frequently advertised, going to be a family yes. Investment yes, that is frequently advertised. The reality is that one needs what is called a four-on-six match of HLA, and if we just think about the basic fact that you get half your genetics from your mom, and have your genetics from your dad, you can imagine that the mom and the dad are a three on six match. And we need at least a four on six match. So in other words, you can imagine that if the mom and dad are not even matches, the uncles, aunts, grandparents, etc., etc., will all not be matches. If you have brothers and sisters from the same two parents, okay, we should emphasize this nowadays, from the same two parents, the chances of having a four on six match amongst sibs are something like 60%. So we are saying, if a child is born, for example, with thalassemia, there is a 60% chance that one of his brothers or sisters, for each of the brothers or sisters, this is obviously, will have a 4 or 6 matching uh, cord blood. And in this case, obviously, one can transfuse that cord blood instead of a bone marrow transplant, okay? And by doing so, one can completely cure the condition. So this is why in these circumstances, in the cases of genetic disease, it makes a total difference and then the chances of using cord blood become enormous, one in four, one in three, okay? So then in those cases, it's definitely recommended for private banking. The other major use of the hematopoietic stem cells is actually for leukemia um, treatments, um, primarily for children. Again, one of the points not usually pointed out is that within a normal cord blood unit, there is only enough stem cells for a body weight of less than 50 kilograms. So like I usually joke with my uh, parents, I need three, okay? So, um, uh, therefore, this is mostly a, pedi a pediatric treatment and in fact I often tell mothers as well when they are talk listening to my talks that if they would like a second opinion, because many of them don't know me and I'm not a practicing clinician, they should ask their pediatricians, not their gynecologists. Unfortunately, these things are sold indirectly or advertised through the clinics of gynecologists, but the truth is the gynecologists almost never use these stem cells. The main uses are through pediatric use and the pediatricians are much more aware of how much these things are useful or not. So like I said, in cases where leukemia, as we know, is not treatable with chemotherapy, as we know in children the great bulk nowadays are, but in the cases where they are not, um, the second line treatment would be a stem cell transplant, we normally talk of this in, in older terminology as a bone marrow transplant, um, and in these cases, again, having cord blood from a sib, again, it has to be a sib, not, not your own, okay, um, will have a good chance of curing you because of what is known as the graft versus leukemia effect. So, so in these cases, it's useful. In other cases, um, the, the stem cells of choice, like I said, are the mesenchymal stem cells which come directly from the cord. And these are useful in, in other conditions. The main two, I think, nowadays would be autoimmune disease. So in autoimmune disease, mesenchymal stem cells actually can uh, suppress the autoimmune response and therefore help reduce the, the, the risk of disease. And there's a lot of trials in this area right now. And there's the famous study, which again is, is misrepresented to, to mothers uh, and expectant parents about the diabetes. Unfortunately, I usually just told diabetes, when actually it is type 1 diabetes, which is not the common kind in world, as we all know. Uh, and even then, having the stem cells is not at all uh, a treatment in itself. One needs to um, take these stem cells, grow them in culture in a GM quality lab, a GLP quality lab, which we don't even have in Malta. Okay, one needs to convert these stem cells into pancreatic cells to replace the pancreas which has been killed in the type 1 diabetes. One needs to then protect these stem cells by a, a barrier of alginate which acts like a sieve which allows glucose and insulin to get in and out without allowing the autoantibodies 
to kill the cells, and then one has to transplant these through intervention or radiology into the liver. So as one can see, this is an extremely complicated procedure, and as you can imagine, government will never pay for this because it is not standard therapy, which is dead cheap, which is insulin. So in a nutshell, you're advising basically couples or even medical practitioners who are giving advice to take everything with a pinch of salt. I, th I think they have to do their own research um, I, 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 or, or talk to people who are uh, more aware of these things. Like I said, most of the pediatricians are, are much more aware than many of the other doctors because they actually have the potential of using these stem cells themselves. Um, I, I give regular talks free of charge as well at the, at the antenatal classes um, for those who, who attend antenatal classes in, in Mother Day. So every, every month or so they call me to give a talk which, where I present most of these things. Thank you, Dr. Cameron Wismar, for your time. I hope that this interview has helped to further your knowledge on the subject, which is quite a subject which is tackled here in Malta, and we're seeing an increased interest from the general public. I invite you to share this video with your professional colleagues and like our Facebook page, Designers. Thank you. Thank you.